greetings and salutations. I'm going to get into the next episode of the series. What we're going to talk about now is a general overview of a modern computer. I stress that it's a general overview. We're not going to get into insane detail, but I want to talk about the different components that make up a modern computer and how Cheat Engine fits into that paradigm. So we're going to keep it a little light, and as we go through the series, we'll definitely go deeper into the specific topics that we're going to talk about today, but a general overview is in order just so we have a, a lay of the land, if you will. So a computer's two, a modern computer, is two, it's made up of two categories of components everyone that most people are familiar with. You have the hardware and you have the software. The hardware is what you can physically touch, obviously. So you have your mouse, your monitor, the computer case itself, and some more um, finer examples of that would perhaps be the processor itself or the RAM, um, if you open up your computer case. And then you have the software, which is the intangible components for the most part in the turn in the sense that you can't actually physically touch them. And some examples are Notepad++, which we can bring up here. Um, any computer games that you play and the application Cheat Engine itself. And we'll bring up Wikipedia to just confirm and have a little, have something on screen. We can ask it to tell us about maybe computer hardware. It's probably a better way to get there. Computer hardware is a collection of physical elements that constitutes a computer system. Some physical parts or components of a computer are the monitor, mouse, keyboard, data storage, hard drive, etc., etc. In contrast, software is instructions that can be stored and run by hardware. So let's click on software. Computer software or software, also known as computer programs, are the non-tangible components of computers. That's pretty much what we just said. So we'll get into some of the We'll get into software more as we go through this, but and we'll talk a little bit more about hardware. But we're going to talk, you know, this series is going to focus more on software, um, and that's just the nature of the series itself. If you're interested in reading more about hardware, this is probably a good jumping off point. You can read about von Neumann architecture and modified Harvard architecture, which is what most modern computers are. Um, I apologize, I have a little bit of a cold today. You can read about the different systems, personal computers, cases, power supplies, motherboards, storage devices, so on and so forth. And they'll even get into mainframes and supercomputers. And If you want to go through and learn all about hardware, this is a good way to do it. And so we'll go back to software. And let's read a little bit more about it. Contrast software with computer hardware, which is the physical component of computers. Computer hardware and software require each other in a complementary relationship. Synergy, one might say. And neither can be realistically used without the other. Computer software includes all computer programs, regardless of their architecture, executable files, libraries, scripts. And we'll talk more about this, but we're going to shrink this for now. So what we're going to talk about next is is going to follow on logically from one of the last things we just said which is or that we just read on Wikipedia which is that hardware and software can't realistically coexist or have a function or a purpose or any practical uses a more specific way to say it they cannot have a practical use without each other and the component that binds them together on a modern personal computer or desktop is the operating system and as we just said, the operating system basically bridges the gap between the physical hardware itself and the end user. So we have a mouse cursor here, we're moving it around, we have our desktop. This, the desktop itself is a function and is an, end, is an interface provided, in most OS's, is an interface provided by the operating system. And as an A-side, will, I will often abbreviate operating system as OS. It's just, it's a common acronym. So as we said, it provides the end user interface. Examples of the most common operating systems, Windows, Linux, Mac, OS X. 
Windows and OS X have their interface. I can't speak authoritatively on OS X because I'm not a Mac user, but certainly, uh, historically speaking, the Windows and, and Apple computers have their end user interface very tightly bound to the, or tightly integrated to the operating system itself. Whereas Linux has taken a much more hands-off approach and does not necessarily make any hard and fast claims about what should the desktop experience be like. Um, it's the Linux is starting to get into that with certain distributions of Linux, Ubuntu being probably a, a good example, Red Hat as well. They have a much more integrated and tightly wound interface that that they distribute. Um, but that's not a function of Linux itself. That's more of a decision made by the distribution. So there is some ambiguity there between the Windows desktop experience, the Mac or the OS X desktop relative to the Linux one. But and you can read more about that by Googling any of those, you know, Linux desktops or Linux distributions or anything like that. And you can read all about it. But for our purposes, we are going to just say that operating systems provide a standard interface for the end user. And by standard interface, everyone's familiar with the Windows taskbar and the start button and stuff like that. Um, more relevant to Cheat Engine and the series here, however, is that operating systems, in the process of an operating or in the um, a practical effect of operating systems bridging the gap between hardware and software and, and the end user, is that they provide a low level interface for computer applications to manipulate the hardware and the and the system itself so an example of this that's relevant to cheat engine is that you could write an application in a, in a specific way so that you can get access to memory of other programs or you could manipulate the instructions of a running application or computer program and these are all done through mechanisms that are provided by the operating system so the operating system the most what most people are familiar with as the as the OS is the desktop and the interface with the mouse and things like that but perhaps more, in my opinion more importantly is that the OS provides facilities for the system to function internally and a lot of the, the mechanisms that it provides in that context is what cheat engine uses and other debuggers as well to do things like memory scanning uh, which is what most people use cheat engine for so much more than the than the end user interface is that operating systems provide libraries if you will and and mechanisms to manipulate the running system itself it's a very important function of an operating system we can go to wikipedia and ask it to tell us about operating systems an OS is a collection of software that manages computer hardware resources and provides common services for computer programs. The operating system is an essential component of the system software in a computer system. Application programs usually require an operating system to function. For the purposes of our series, we are going to say that application programs absolutely always require an operating system to function. We'll never deal with a situation where that will not be the case. For hardware functions such as input-output memory allocation, the operating system acts as an intermediary between programs and the computer hardware. Although the application code is usually executed directly by the hardware and will frequently make a system call to an OS function. We'll talk about that later in the series. Examples of popular modern operating systems include Android, it runs on your phone, BSDs, we're not going to talk about that, iOS runs on your Apple, Linux, OS X, Microsoft Windows, and that's what we will say. Um, see if we can get a little bit more examples. Everyone, for our purposes in this series, we're only going to be using Windows. Let's see what it has to say about that. It's not a whole lot. Let's go to components. Go to user interface. Every computer that is to be operated by an, by an individual requires a user interface. That's pretty much what we're talking about as far as the desktop experience, if you will. The two most common forms of a user interface have, have historically been the command line interface, 
and the graphical user interface or GUI. We'll make use of both during the series. Maybe not so much the command line. We won't use the command line a whole lot, but I'm sure there will be times where we will use a facsimile of the command line or the command line itself. So now we have a general overview of an operating system. We're going to talk about applications, programs, and processes. So let's start off with a program. What is a computer program? In technical vernacular, a computer program is a generic term that is used to refer to a set of instructions, a set of computer instructions. So let's say that we wanted our computer to add, we will use, um, I guess we'll do that, we'll close all this stuff. I'm trying to be a little bit more organized than the previous series, so I'm making actual outlines. But let's say we wanted to tell the computer, uh, what is, what is, what's our, let's first define our purpose. Our purpose is tell the computer to add 10 to itself. To 10. Add 10 and 10. So that's our purpose. So let's just, we're going to make up some code. So let's just say we wanted, you know, here's set, or here's our instructions. And then everything below instructions, we're just 10 plus 10. So that's only one instruction for in our made up instruction language. So if we just go to the computer and we say 10 plus 10, that's our computer program. Now is it an application or you know what's the what's the categorization? We're not even at that point yet. We'll talk about that in a little bit. But let's say we wanted to do something more complicated and then say um Let's assign this, say the result of this operation right here. We'll store that value in X, just as everyone's familiar with in basic algebra. And then let's say we wanted to divide X by 2, and we will get 10. Or we would just do that, actually. So let's just say that. Um, there is no, as every, most people are familiar with, there's no division sign that most people are familiar with um, in basic math so in computers you just use the slash so then we'll assign the value of x to whatever x is currently and we will divide whatever x is currently by 2 and we'll assign that to x so x will start off at 20 and then x will be 10 so now our computer program is two instructions now if we wanted to add another one we could say x equals can't type today x plus 3 so what is it now x equals 13 So we could go on and on and on, but the basic point that we're making here is that a program does not, in the in a technical sense, a computer program does not apply any sort of label as to what an application is, or what its function is, or what the set of instructions does. It's just, it is a generic term for a set of instructions for the computer, and that's it. And when you start trying to, or not, well, I really can't type. But when you start trying to categorize and classify these things, you get you start using the term application. And there's in a general sense, an application helps the user perform a specific task. So Notepad++ is an example of an application. Microsoft Office is an example of a collection of applications. So Word would be one application, Excel would be another application, so on and so forth. In an application, so when you start trying to categorize computer programs and you start using application, you categorize applications in different ways. So you have user applications and then, you know, you have um, productivity uh, applications. So Office would be a good example of that. It's going to be a productivity suite. Um, games are an example of another application. Um, but in a general sense, an application helps the user perform a specific task. And you might ask yourself, what does gaming help me do? It's a, just a subset of applications that it helps you detach from reality, if you ask me. But um, in a general sense, an application helps the user perform a task. We can contrast this with system software, which is 
or system applications, if you although that's never used, we'll just call it system software. System software is our computer programs that do not help the end user accomplish any specific task. Um, you could say the operating system is perhaps an example of system software, but I don't really I don't like that distinction. More often than not, the OS provides system software. And we won't we'll deal with system software later on in the series, but um, for our purposes at this point, we will just say that when we use the word application, we are referring to something like Notepad or something like Cheat Engine itself that is helping us do something. And when we use the phrase system software, we're referring to programs that do not directly enable the user to do anything but provide more background or internal functionality or enable certain mechanisms for end user applications to then use in order to accomplish something for the end user. So maybe a, um, a contrived example, or not contrived, but an example would be that Microsoft Office or Microsoft Word, we'll just use one application of it, does it uses system software to accomplish its goal. It's It uses mechanisms provided by other computer programs to do what it needs to do. It doesn't do all that stuff itself. Um, maybe that's a terrible example, but that's all we're gonna say about that for now. We're gonna move on to processes. What is a process? We can go to the task manager and you can see that the task manager itself has something it has different tabs. One of them is applications, shows you what's running, and then it has something for processes and it's populated by all these things. So what's the difference? Is Can we use the terms synonymously? And we'll talk about the interchangeability of the terms, but in a technical sense, a process is a live program. So what do we mean by that? This is our set of instructions. These instructions are not being, you know, for in our made up language, these instructions are not actually being run. So you have to write down the instructions for the computer and then in a separate step you have to actually run those instructions and feed it into the computer and say, hey, I want you to do these things. So the demarcation is a program is, or a, um, a process rather, is a program that is currently being executed by the computer system itself or by the operating system is maybe a, um, an easier way to understand that. So in applications here we have two running applications but in processes we have all these other things that are using up memory and so the difference between these two tabs is in applications the task, ma or task manager is basically saying I don't need to inform the user about um, the Microsoft security client user interface process because it's a background kind of system software related and it's just not going to show up in your actual application list by default or at least it doesn't in mine whereas I, when you go to the process processes tab Windows is saying alright I'm going to show you every live program or maybe not all of them but certainly a fair amount of live pro uh, live programs that are currently being executed inside Windows, and so every process here and on some computer and they're proprietary and you'll you know probably never see it, but every process in this list, someone sat down and wrote instructions just like I mean they're not adding to X they're doing functional things, but wrote a series of instructions or source code is generally what it's called, and when that when those instructions are actually executed by your computer it is considered a process and inside every process is some representation of these instructions that can that the computer understands so we'll use firefox as an example firefox is a rather is a pretty large computer program or more specifically an application and there's all kinds of source code that make it do things so um, there's source, you know, when I click on the help here and it populates this, there's a set of instructions that controls what Firefox is going to show me. And then when I click on this, there's a set of instructions that's going to tell me about what version I'm running and how to display it and how big the window should be, so on and so forth. And 
because it's in the process list, it means that Firefox.exe is actually running on my computer right now. So if we close it, Firefox goes away. It's obviously not in the applications because it's not running and it's not in the process list either because it's no longer a live program or a live, yeah, it's no longer a live program or process that is being executed by the computer. So you may ask yourself what, what relevance does this have? The relevance that this has is that when you start using Cheat Engine and, and attaching it or trying to debug, hack, cheat, whatever you want to say, to different games, it's going to attach two processes. It's not going to give you the application list. It's just going to it's going to give you a list of all the processes that are currently running on your system, or most of them, and it's going to ask you which one do you want me to attach to. And we'll talk more about what attach specifically means and, and what it does and that and what that entails. But it's important to note, and we will use talk about processes a lot as the series goes on. It's sort of a fundamental unit in computing or in mo in modern computing. And there's a whole lot going on under the hood for different processes. And it's important that we have a good base to work from. As an A-side, maybe it's important to note that an application may actually be several processes. It's not often the case, but it's worth noting that sometimes, some games, I've seen it before, that you start them up and you'll have one, you'll see in the application list that it's running, but when you look at the process list or you open up Cheat Engine, you go to attach to the game, you'll actually see sometimes two, I've even seen one with three processes that are related to the game and how do you know which one to attach to generally I look for the one with the largest memory footprint so you just look at memory um, and if one of them has two megs and then the other one has four megs and then the other one has 800 megs odds are the game's really running and you know it's really the 800 meg one um, that's not always going to hold true and you'll probably not see it a whole lot but it's worth noting that an application is not it's not a one-to-one -one mapping an application does not necessarily is not it is not required that an application is only one process an application can be any number of processes as long as it's designed in a specific in that in that way although by far the most common case is that it is a one-to-one -one mapping in most cases so let's talk about common hardware so uh, everyone's or most people are familiar with the with the processor or the CPU, the central processing unit, as the case may be. Basically, the job of the processor is to execute instructions, all logical operations. If is maybe a better way to put that. It's a little more vague, but what we'll say is that all instructions are they go through the processor or the CPU. The terms for our purposes will be used interchangeably. It is the only device on a modern computer that is capable of executing instructions and making other components react or act accordingly. So sort of the quintessential analogy is you think of it as the brain. That's not an entirely inaccurate analogy, but it's not an entirely accurate one either. But for our overview purposes, and we will get more into the distinction and, and why thinking of it as a brain is maybe not accurate, but for our general overview purposes, we will say that the processor is in fact the brain. And in a more technical sense, it is responsible for executing all instructions. And it is the only thing capable of executing instructions and making the computer do things. The next component we'll talk about is the RAM, where uh, random access memory is what it actually stands for. But the first thing to note about RAM is that it is not persistent. So when you power off your computer, or your computer crashes, or you lose power, anything inside RAM, you're gonna is you're gonna lose it. You're never gonna find it again, and that's a function of how RAM is implemented. It's again, it's not persistent, or it's volatile, is what sort of the the technical phrase is. And it means exactly what we just said. No power, no data. As long as you have power, you're safe. 
the trade-off here is that RAM is very fast relative to your hard disk or um, hard drive, one might actually say. Um, and that line's becoming a little bit more blurry with solid state drives and things like that, but um, we're not going to talk about that. What we will say is that RAM is, for our current purposes, we will say that RAM is infinitely faster. It's not infinite, obviously, but it's much, much faster than your hard drive, and it's designed to be that way. And relative or contrast RAM with persistent or volatile storage with persistent or non-volatile storage which is basically any storage device that retains data when it has no power and the quintessential example is modern hard drives flash drives things like that so just to review we talked about three basic things or three basic components of hardware you have your processor that is responsible for executing instructions such as our fake ones right here these will eventually let's say we had a way to tell the computer actually execute these instructions it doesn't matter what you're writing the instructions in what language at some point these instructions will find its way will find their way to the processor and be fed directly into it and the computer will react and do those calculations or whatever the instructions are the computer will act accordingly then we have RAM which is volatile storage in the sense that if it loses power you lose all your data but it is incredibly fast and then you have your persistent storage which is much slower than RAM but no power you retain your data so let's expand on RAM a little bit and talk about what RAM is used for it is used for live applications live processes and any of their data and it's used for other things as well, but for our purposes here, we're for our overview purposes, we're gonna say that RAM is basically, all these running processes right here are stored in the RAM of your computer. And the reason is technical, and we'll talk about that in future videos, but basically, it's much more efficient to store this sort of data in RAM and then have the processor act on it than it is to store this on your hard drive or uh, slower storage. So the actual instructions as we wrote them here, if we save this file, then they will be stored on our hard drive. But because it's an unsaved file, and the notepad++ right here is stored in RAM, all the data of this document is stored in RAM, makes it fast, makes it responsive. <clears throat> but as soon as you save it, and give it some name, and you hit save, it flushes that data out to your persistent storage, <clears throat> and now it's safe and you can turn your computer off. In the context of Cheat Engine, this is important because games are always, say we start up a game and it's running and we attach it to the process, we are attaching Cheat Engine to the memory or to the process of the game and all that is in RAM. And we will talk much, much more about how RAM is organized and memory management as we start to get into um, some of the finer details of how Cheat Engine operates. But for now, it's important to note that any running process for our, what we will say is that anything that you, any running process on your computer is stored in RAM and that's it. The actual instructions that comprise that running program are stored on some persistent storage, obviously. But once you actually run those instructions and the and the and the process and the program starts running and basically becomes a registered process, all that the state of that program or process is in RAM. And again, the reason why is because it makes it fast and it makes it nice. So I want to go over a little bit what the process of application development is, and we'll see why this is relevant. We're not going to turn this into um, a comp or into a programming 101 course or application development 101, but <clears throat> I want to go over it briefly, and this will it will become a little obvious about why I want to talk about it as we get towards the end of it, but certainly as we get into using Cheat Engine and dealing with some of the idiosyncrasies of um, of Cheat Engine and and how to manipulate games and stuff like that we'll start to see that the, some of the decisions that are made during application development directly affect how easy and how difficult it can be to use Cheat Engine on a game. 
or on anything. So how do you, what is the process of application development? You decide on a programming language. We'll just, it's not, we'll talk about what program, programming languages are later, but you can certainly Wikipedia it now if you wanted to. So you pick a programming language in a development environment and using those two things a programmer writes a series of instructions such as the three instructions we have right here to perform some task. Maybe that task is I want to have a 3D game. Maybe that task is I want to add 10 to itself and then divide by 2 and then add 3. It doesn't matter. Anything that the computer anything that you can express in the instructions of a, for a computer the computer will do the end result of this of these instructions and the development environment and things like that the end result of the whole thing is a binary file or an executable file as some people are familiar with on windows you can see that everything every process in this list certainly ends in .exe that's just uh, file extension for executable and it means this has binary data and that I'm ready you know you double click on it and Windows says yep I'll run that and by running it it means I'm gonna feed those instructions into the processor and I will have a process assigned to that program so this is important in the context of cheat engine as we said because some of the decisions made while they're writing the instructions directly impacts how directly impacts the difficulty of using cheat engine on it and we'll finish by talking about the life cycle of an application this is you could probably stop now but it, to me it seems logical to talk about it a little bit so let's talk about application life cycle there's a million different thoughts on it but basically and this is relevant because you know games are app not because you know but games are applications and Developing an application, developing a game, very similar life cycles. So let's give you a little insight into how games are made. First you design it, and the basic question is what is the problem we are solving? Because all computer programs solve some sort of problem. That problem may be I want to play um, a game where my, my character's name is Agent 47. Or, you know, I want to fly a spaceship. That is a problem that you are solving, even if it's not considered a problem in the traditional sense. When you're designing a computer program, the first question is, what problem are we solving? Then you, once you've decided what that problem is, you generally transition to development. And you can sort of one-line that by saying, let's solve the problem that we are solving. You've decided what the problem is. Now I want to solve the problem. So you develop and you write instructions. Then you test it and basically you're asking yourself did we solve the problem that we were supposed to solve and you test to verify that indeed you have solved that problem then you deploy it so you're telling everybody let me solve this problem for you and so you deploy your application people install it they use it and you solve this problem for them you offer support so you want to keep on solving that same problem you want to keep on flying that spaceship and then eventually you get to end of life and the problem is solved and you can fly your spaceship and most issues have been resolved and that's pretty much the life cycle, if you will, of an application. And this, we're going to stop here.